I'm Courtney. I'm the senior economics reporter at Axios. This is Judy Marks. She's the CEO, president, and chair of Otis, uh, just as the introduction suggested. Um, I have so many questions for you, but I feel like I want to tell the audience a little bit about your background before we begin. Um, so as the audience knows by now, you run a company called Otis. It makes things that are really important to the average person, but we don't think about it unless there's a problem, as I was telling you backstage. Elevators and escalators, they kind of just exist, but if there's a problem, we're very upset. Um, you're an engineer by trade. Uh, you started your career at IBM as a systems manager, if I'm, if I, if I'm getting that right, um, you have a really rich understanding of the industrial sector. You worked at in uh, Lockheed Martin. You worked at IBM. You worked with Barbara, who is on the the panel before this one. Um, and when you joined Otis in 2017, it was part of a conglomerate called United Technologies. But then United Technologies merged with Raytheon and then spun off Otis and Carrier. Do I have that right? You got that, it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A uh, short 40 years. <laughs> Um, and by the time that Otis was listed on the New York Stock Exchange as an independent firm, um, it was April 2020, which is a very interesting time to um, take over a company. Um, and I definitely want to get back to that. But the first thing I have to ask you is um, something I learned about Otis, which is a few towns over from where Otis is headquartered in Connecticut, there is a building that ex exists for the sole purpose of testing elevators. So my question for you is, have you have you thought about diversifying your revenue and like opening that up as some sort of theme park ride, just like going up and down? I feel like people would really enjoy that. <laughs> Yeah, listen, it's uh, first of all, it's great to be here with everybody, and and thanks, Courtney. Um, we are we are a an incredibly iconic brand. I'm pleased to say, entering our 171st year in business, U.S. company, um, and uh, started in Yonkers, New York, and and today the proud proud employer of 71,000 colleagues throughout the world. But what's more important is is we move the world. And we move the world, as you said, without without people really thinking about it. So think about kind of the first autonomous vehicle, uh, the, again, in a regulated environment that you all trust us with your safety and reliability. And one of the reasons you do that is because we ensure we have a safe product and service, which takes me to Bristol, Connecticut, the home of our test tower, as well as the home of ESPN. For those of you who, there's two things in Bristol, more than two things in Bristol, I'm sure. Um, our test tower, it's, uh, it's, it's really an amazing feat. It stands 117 meters tall, think about 383 feet tall, um, 28 stories, 14 hoistways dedicated to ensuring we can do live testing and we can do life testing for service life extension because you don't think twice when you use our product. And 2.3 billion people a day feel the same way. And that's a tremendous responsibility. But elevators are used for a lot of reasons and a lot of urbanization going on in the world. We passed 8 billion people in late 2022. Uh, that's going to continue to grow. It's going to grow at different, late, uh, different levels in emerging markets. It's going to peak in other mature markets. But basically, between population aging, urbanization demand, um, people need rise. And we have the product that gave, gave rise to that. Some are used to move you for work. Some are moved to move you, move you for pleasure. And we do have a lot of elevators that do just what you said, that, that provide pleasure, take you up to the highest peaks, whether it's the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world, or whether it's the Tower of Terror, which has Otis technology safely putting you on a ride in Disney. Um, so so we, have, um, we have multiple uses, but again, it's all about the safe, reliable, and, and, and now more digitally enabled way to help you travel and, and move about your life. Yeah, so just to put a fine point on it, I cannot go to Bristol and enter this building and take joy rides up and down. No, you okay. can't. <laughs> All right, got it. So you mentioned technology, and that's obviously the theme of, of this uh, panel, our conversation today, how it's reshaping industry. But I, I do want to set the backdrop a little bit, as you were starting to do in, in your remarks. Um, you oversee a huge global company that provides critical services for, you know, a lot of people, and you control a lot of parts of the process, manufacturing, design, uh, servicing. Um, so 
you must have pretty unique insight into the into how the economy is faring. Uh, what is the elevator indicator telling us about the macro economy right now? Uh, you sound like my the sell side analyst on my earnings call. Sorry, that's okay. I'll, <laughs> I'll share with you what we know. And and there are times uh, again because we are so global, we go to we go to market in every country except sanctioned countries, and we're very local. Um, I heard Barbara use the term global. We're we're very local as well. Seventy one thousand colleagues, about ten thousand in the U S. So we are truly distributed in almost every city and community in the world. Um, so we do get, we get two interesting views. We get a view of the construction market because our 17 manufacturing plants and our installation teams locally install elevators, escalators, moving walkways and infrastructure and new buildings. But just as importantly, we have the, the as built world that we all live in which says even in a digital world, we still have a legacy and an as-built world to deal with. And what that means is we deal with a lot of understanding property managers, whether it's commercial, office, data centers, warehouses, infrastructure. When you think about our product and how it gets used, it's pretty ubiquitous. As long as you're three floors or above, we, we have a product for you. So we do get to watch the trends. We do understand uh, and, and carefully watch for, on the front end for our developers, general contractors, how interest rates do impact uh, decisions on, on starting projects. Um, but I'm, I'm encouraged uh, this quarter, first quarter this year here in North America, although still still feeling some of the impacts, obviously, on interest rates for construction, uh, is better than the second half of last year, where, where we saw a more rapid decline. South Asia, uh, South Europe is growing nicely, surprisingly, when you think about Spain, Italy. Uh, North Europe is struggling. Uh, the, the, our segment alone in Germany was down 30% last year. So you can see where people are making decisions on investments and on development, and we see that early. But where, when it comes to, I get asked a lot of time about return to work, and mm -hmm. it's a, it's a very unique, high density city issue in North America, specifically, I would say New York, San Francisco. Everywhere else in the world, People have moved on. Everyone's back to work. You go to any part of Asia, most parts of Europe. Five days a week? Pretty much. Wow. Almost everywhere in the world. No hybrid work? Very limited. Okay. Very limited. And so, you know, when we think about the, our world, which is there are 22 million elevators and escalators being used every day, and that grows mid-single digits every year, um, you know, we, we just see a nice growth market, a nice ability, again, to help populations that are aging. We help buildings that were built before elevators. Believe it or not, there are a lot of walk-ups that that where the where the condominium associations, the the uh, the inhabitants want want technology. And then we see, you know, the ability in our in our world. What our customers tell us is it's very simple. We want we want safe, effective, speedy uh, delivery of people, traffic flow, which is what we optimize and what we use AI in traffic flow, so that we have. So that as we build a building, we require less space and less hoistways to give you, and we can then either rent or sell that space. That that's what's that's the the world we're living in today, which which creates a much different environment than we've seen from what was predominantly a mechanical or an electromechanical product since since uh, since our founder invented the safety brake. Now it's it is a connected product, and I'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah, that's my next question. I mean. I I, I want to know how elevators have become more innovative over the years. Like, what does a high tech, new, cool elevator look like? And how else are you incorporating AI and digital technology into other aspects of your business? Well, I like to think of all of our products as cool and okay. no favorites. No, no. And, okay. and, and I get, you know, I, I, it's fun the pictures I get of our vintage elevators. I'll get everyone sent, seems to like to text me, Hey, have you seen this one? It's like, okay. those are cool again. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because we still have elevators in operation. We have one in operation in India from the 1890s. I mean, these are still, this is when I talk about the, the existing legacy environment as we move towards digital, we, it's great to, to, have the vision for the future, but the how you get there from the as is to the to be in a world we all live in is is going to be uh, really interesting. So it it the, the simplest way to describe mobility, and I think it goes beyond beyond just our company, but certainly in our industry, is all about being connected. 
And it's the connection you want to have with the passengers. As I said, you know, think about the entire population of the world. You want to have that connection where information flow can happen effectively. So if you want to, you can use an app on, on your smartphone and you can actually call the elevator as you're leaving your, your residence, your condo, your apartment, you're leaving your office. Um, if you also integrated obviously with access control, with biometrics. So as you enter a building, it can recognize you without you having to, to do a thing or touch your, touch your phone or do anything. And you have the ability to get through the access control system, you get verified, and then our technology tells you which elevator to go to because we actually have smart dispatching. We call it smart grouping. Many of you may have seen this. In our world, the tradition was you would get in an elevator and you'd press a button. The challenge with that is you end up stopping on a lot of floors that you don't desire to be at. Yes. And you can't, you can't control the acceleration and the speed. I also push buttons by mistake. Okay. Well, and that we annoys know, everyone. Like yeah. You. I'm that person. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you're not that child. We, we have to, we actually have the algorithm that allows us when every button's pressed to, to clear them. Um, cause children love it, right? And we all love that they, lo that they love being part of our, of our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. But when you think about now, for many of you, you walk in a building and before you ever get to the elevator, we call it our Compass 360 product, you actually push a button to say where you're going. And you say, okay, well, what is that? Well, that's smart grouping for us. That allows us to group people that are heading to like floors so that you can get the benefit of acceleration, you can get the benefit of energy efficiency, and you can get there faster. And we can actually reduce the amount of space these tenants need by up to 50% when we use this technology. So that's about being connected. But, but all that's fine in terms of the movement. The key is the data. The key is understanding traffic flow, information, when things are busy. You probably wouldn't guess the busiest time in an office building. What do you think that is? Mm, like in a post-COVID world where no one's going into the office? In a normal world. In a normal world. Um, the morning when everyone's getting in? It's actually lunchtime. Oh, lunchtime. Because oh. you have two-way trips, right? People are coming down, people are going up. Ah. So how do you optimize How do you optimize for that? And then as one customer recently said to me, that's great, but remember, we're bringing 500 summer interns in this year and they really care. You know, they're all, they're all new tech. And so, so it's all about using the data and how we do that is through the internet of things. Mm -hmm. So we take what, what you traditionally think about and all you see is the car and the cab. You don't see all the, the electronics and the technology behind it. You don't see the counterweights. You don't see the, see, see the technology that supports it. But we instrument each of our elevators and we now have 900,000 of our 2.3 million units that we service connected and they're constantly feeding us information. They're feeding us performance information, they're feeding us fault information, but most importantly what they're feeding us is the ability to be predictive, transparent, and for us to be able to repair an elevator before it ever breaks down. Because we use a data lake and we say, well, we know there are 15,000 of these operating in this part of the world. And when you hit this number of cycles, you're probably going to have a door misalignment. And so before that happens, we're going to send a mechanic out there with the right part at the time before it breaks down. And that's really what our customers want. They want their, they want their systems to work. Nobody wants to walk in and see that, that an elevator escalator is not working. That's the la you hate seeing that. We hate seeing that. So the internet of things just gives us the ability to, to, to make judgments, to be transparent. And we make sure our customers see this too. And so all of this together in this connected world uh, gives us data gives us predictability. I think eventually it'll give us prognostics and the ability to, to actually self-heal. Um, but the one thing about our industry that may be different than most of you is it's, it's obviously regulated for safety and it's life safety. So you trust us and we know we can't be off. We know we can't just allow technology to, to be an early gen AI adopter to repair your to repair your elevator. So we walk this fine line and this responsibility as a as a long cycle business that again you've trusted with your you trust us every day to be able to marry up the advanced technologies to be able to provide enhanced services, to be able to provide um, predictive technologies, but to do it in a responsible way. 
And, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about where AI is going and Gen AI, but it's, to me, it's all about doing it responsibly. And, 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 and we have that responsibility as, as the leader in the industry. Yeah, so there's no moving fast and breaking things at Otis just because the nature of the product that you produce is so important. And you're right, you have our lives in your hands. So that to me seems like such an interesting tension. I mean, I'm sure you sit back and see how quickly technology is moving and how quickly innovation is happening. And aren't you tempted to just jump in? both feet first and say, let's try this. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a technologist at heart. That's right. You I'm, love technology. Yeah. I, I am always tempted to do it and we will tempt, we will do it, but we'll do it in the right places at the right time. So, you know, an example, we, we provide our API, uh, our application programming interface to operate the elevator to proven companies who right now all over the world are implementing robotics and they're having robots in a hotel deliver room service. They're having robots deliver supplies in a hospital and they're doing this in a way where they, again, and I, and I know you've had these discussions where we want to find the right place for human value add versus the right place where AI can replace some of the more repetitive, menial, or other tasks. So for us, it, and you think about labor challenges that was just spoken about in the last panel, when you think about the labor challenges you have, if you can then instead use a robot, if that robot can electronically and digitally talk to the elevator, which it can, you can predefine, do you want it on there when people are traveling, or do you... We know, we know when people are there, or do you want to wait? So, so we have all these abilities to use technology. We use it in our customer care centers. We use it in robotic process automation. We use it in multiple places. But it's been predictive AI, not generative AI. And so you move to the world of generative AI, which obviously everybody's discussing. I still think it's, it's nascent. But what we've done is we've said, we know there will be use cases for it. There is no doubt in our company, we will have applications for Gen AI. And what we want to do is crowdsource that from our own company. So we have, again, safety minded, we've created our own instance, working with all the leading tools because our large language model, I honestly don't want our IP going out anywhere in the universe. I don't, we have a competitive advantage. So we've created our own fence. And in that fence, we've turned it on for, for our colleagues and said, play with it. We call it Ask Elijah. Elijah Otis was our founder. And so, so ask Elijah, build up the knowledge base, build up the large language model, but also think through use cases where we can apply this to help our business, to help our shareholders, but most importantly, to help our customers. Mm. So I think there isn't a single company or in any industry that isn't trying to evaluate this, isn't trying to apply this, isn't trying to figure out the ethics of this. And we have to do it responsibly. But we can't, we can't just say, I'll wait. I don't believe any of us can, can be longtime followers. But you have to find what works for your enterprise. And that's what we're doing. So something we've sort of been talking about but haven't actually said the word yet uh, is productivity. Um, I was reading through your earnings call, which uh, happened last week, and that was a word that was mentioned 15 times, productivity. How do you make workers more productive? And as I'm sure the audience know uh, knows, America is in the midst of an extraordinary productive boom. But the critical question for the economy right now is how sustainable is it? Um, and what role will these technologies like generative AI um, play in, uh, you know, keeping that productivity boom going? So, I mean, I struggle with this because productivity is a really squishy, vague term, and we haven't really figured out how to measure it. But like, what does improved productivity look like at Otis? Is it something that you all measure? Um, is it you guys were doing things one way, you know, a few years ago, and now you're doing it this way? What does increased productivity look like? Yeah, I think I can speak for most companies, but but we try to instrument and measure and have key performance indicators on as much as you can. And we do measure productivity. So we really have two businesses. We have a new equipment business again, which puts us more 17 manufacturing plants. In there, we measure two items. We measure material productivity. 
how are we doing in all of our manufacturing KPIs, using Industry 4.0, using IoT on the floor of our manufacturing plants? How are we doing in being able to measure and bring down the cost of production? But for us, that's just a piece of it because an elevator is a unique industrial product. We don't ship a final product. We ship at the, our final product gets installed in a hoistway on a construction site in a building. We ship multiple pallets in, in agreed order so that they can get installed as a construction site's going up. So for us, we then measure installation productivity. So on any given day in the world, we are installing elevators or escalators at 10,000 locations. Now, it takes longer than a day, but on any day, anywhere in the world, that's what we're doing. So understanding how our colleagues are doing in terms of performing that installation, making sure they get the parts in the right sequence with the digital instructions on how to install them, making sure they can test them, simulations we do in, 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 our, in our test labs to make sure they can be more efficient, all of that helps, an app that helps them actually integrate all the, communica the wireless communications that go on inside an elevator, trust me. So we measure material productivity and installation productivity. In our service business, which is about 60% of our revenue and last year was over 90% of our profits, we focus on service productivity. How many, t how many hours does it take if there's an issue, time to repair? How long does it take us to answer, answer a call? So for that, you say, well, how can you, how can you apply technology beyond what we call Otis One or IoT? We do route optimization software. We have a fleet of 22,000 vehicles. And so how can we make sure that as we're, as our, as our incredible field professionals are, are working, how can we make them more efficient and effective first to respond to a call? or to schedule their routes if on, on scheduled maintenance. But then once they're there, are they there with the right part? Do they know in a 12-story building where to go? Where's the issue? Well, this is what IoT tells us. It says, go to the seventh floor, and it's, it's the landing door. Mm. So they don't have to spend as much time there. And, and when they're more productive, and I, I tell this, we've got 42,000 field professionals in our company. And what I tell them is, we're here to grow our company. And we need more and more of you, but we need you more productive. We don't need less of you. Automation's not going to replace you. But as we continue to grow our service portfolio, which is 2.3 million units we maintain and do 200,000 service calls every day, this is where we need you to be more productive. So if you were handling 12, 12 units last year, this year we need you to handle 13 in that same day. But we can't just say work faster or smarter. We have to give them tools. So we've developed proprietary applications that help them. We've, we've created, you know, the ability for them, as I said, through IoT to have that, that abil ability. We had, we had an app that we were using in our labs. We call it Tune. It's now on every mechanics, field mechanics iPhone. And it allows you to put the iPhone on, on the floor of the elevator or on the rail of the escalator and measure vibration and noise. Okay, it's not Spotify. No. Okay, no. Because Tune sounds like... I, yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure Daniel will be okay with that. <laughs> so, but, but when you think about it, in the past, you could say, well, Jude, how, how'd you used to do this? We had very seasoned mechanics who used their ears. Think, oh, my gosh. Right? I mean, think back in time. So now they have the ability not just to, to see it, but we, report, we tell them exactly, you're intolerance, you're not. If you're not intolerance, here's what you need to adjust. So it is all about productivity, but not to have less labor. It's so that we can continue to grow the economy. Our typical, our typical field mechanic is here in the U.S. goes through a four-year apprenticeship. We just can't create them overnight. So, so how do we continue to grow our business, which we've been doing on the top line and, and you know, been doing double-digit EPS growth? How do we do that with, that, with, with the pool, labor pool we have and the labor pool we want to grow, but there's a time lag? Mm -hmm. so. Something that's so interesting to me is the more productive your products become, the more productive I can be, the less time I am standing in the lobby waiting for my elevator or the less time I spend in an actual elevator as it goes through every, you know, stop. But we like you to be in it. We like you to be moving well when you're in it because in most of our elevators part of technology, we have we have a screen that's sharing information, sharing advertising, about oh. eight seconds on the eyeball. All of a sudden, you know, again, it's the passenger experience too, but you may want to know as you're riding up that the, that the cafeteria is going to have a special that day for lunch okay. that you wouldn't know any other way. 
Usually I'm looking at TikTok if I'm being <laughs> head down like this, but um, the less time I spend um, doing the things I, I, I might have been doing when technology, we didn't have this type of technology, you know, the more time I can spend reading your earnings calls or doing go. something that makes my own company uh, more productive. So that's interesting. I guess I would like to ask you more pointedly, is there, we know there's a macro productivity boom underway. Is there a micro productivity boom at Otis right now, or how would you characterize it? Hey, listen, we challenge every one of our colleagues to be for to focus on productivity. We, we have, uh, let me just step back. We have three things we call our absolutes. And, you know, a lot of companies have values and different things. We think it's really simple when you say they're absolute because they're table stakes. You can't be part of our company if you don't do it. Safety which you all understand why. We want every passenger to be safe. We want every one of our 71,000 colleagues to go home every night safe. Ethics, because we want to do business the right way, and quality. And it's that quality absolute that really drives us to continuous improvement and, and to doing really everything we want to do. But yeah, it is all about changing lifestyles. We have seen, we've seen every cycle since 1853. And we've seen it in every country. So... Productivity, we ask every one of our colleagues to contribute to. The three we measure, service productivity, material productivity, installation productivity, all help us understand where we have opportunities. But not all cultures are alike. And I said I had 22,000 vehicles. In certain countries, our mechanics take, take the metro because it's a very small location. Or they ride bikes. Or so, so we're dealing with different cultures, but what we are seeing is this incredible demand for urbanization, this incredible demand for mobility, this incredible demand for, for digital information that you probably don't even recognize you're receiving or that, that you need. And it will make, this does make life better. It makes life better for, for, for the people as they age. It makes life better in hospitals to be able to literally move people. We learned that during COVID when we were an essential service for transit, for hospitals. It just, everything we do is all about making life better. And our, our vision is really simple. We give people freedom to connect and thrive in a taller, faster, smarter world. We don't talk about elevators and escalators. But when we talk about taller, faster, and smarter, the smarter is all about digital. It's all about how can we continue to evolve what's become a, a, uh, a, a, an essential service in everyone's life to becoming more of that essential service in a way that doesn't interrupt your lifestyle, but gives you the speed, the safety, and the reliability you need. You entered this industry in the 1980s, and there was something similar going on. Uh, technology was moving very quickly, much like it is now. Um, how do you compare the pace of innovation now to then? Is it moving quickly? And if you do think it's moving more quickly, does that scare you? No, it doesn't scare me. So I've, I've been blessed 40 years watching the the absolute adoption of technology. I won't describe what it was like in 1984. Any of you in the room will remember it. <laughs> it it is moving faster. The, the and it's not just it's not just the pace of technological change that's moving faster. It's the pace of life that's moving faster. The pace of change in everything we're doing. And so, how do you adapt? How do you become more agile? How do you how do you move faster but with responsibility? All of those are the challenges we face. I think it's great to embrace it. Um, I think you need to do it again in a responsible way. But, but technology is not to be feared. Disruption is not to be feared. There isn't, there isn't anyone in this room who hasn't lived through some sort of technological disruption. Our company is no different. And when I, when I joined Otis in, in late 17, you know, I, I was very clear with our team. We were in a pretty insulated, older, long cycle industrial. And I said, we're going to change. We're going to change. We're going to, we're going to drive digitalization. We're going to grow this business again. And, and, you know, couldn't be more proud of our team and how we've done it. But you do it by embracing change and embracing technology and disrupting yourselves. And all I can share is, you know, as the leader in this industry, we're going to continue doing that. So, I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that um, you took Otis public as an independent firm April 2020. April 3rd, yeah. It was, oof. I would not recommend 
listing during COVID, at the, f the first month of world global COVID. I really hope we don't have to remember that recommendation. <laughs> I hope there is not another global pandemic. But I wanted to ask you, when, it, when you think about the pandemic, do you think it pulled forward innovation that maybe you might have done anyway? Or do you think that you had to do things to adapt to this weird world that you've kind of had to undo as things start to normalize? Yeah, we, we have not undone anything. Okay. Let, let, me, let me be clear. Matter of fact, we've probably doubled down on our R&D investment, our product investment, our sales coverage, our service investment, our IoT has grown significantly, um, and we'll continue to grow it. Um, we've made that commitment. We're using our own CapEx to do it because we think it's the right answer for us and our customers and, and our colleagues and our shareholders. So I don't think there's a pullback. I think what we all felt was a shock. And you got to learn from that shock. And I think we did. We learned resilience. Um, we learned how you needed to use technology even more because, you you know, we, we learned all about, you know, we always talked about safety. We didn't always talk about health. Mm. Guess what? We're talking about health now. And in, the, in COVID, we talked about physical health, right? We talked about, and we created, you know, the ability for you wouldn't have to touch a button because people were nervous at the time there, cleaning escalator rails. We, we've gotten past all that. Now we're talking about mental well-being and health. So I think I think these these shocks and these changes just make us better and make us more well-rounded, make us explore even more and do it faster. So you talked about how you kind of introduced um, the ability to not touch buttons mm -hmm. because there was fear of, you know, sp spreading the virus. Is is there still demand for that type of product, you know, in some parts of the world? So so it's obviously an offering, but it's it's very it's it's de minimis. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but but we had we had spent probably 50 years hiding fans and elevators because you worried more about the aesthetics in them, right? And then COVID happened and everyone's like, "Well, what about airflow?" And we're like, there's a fan in every elevator in case you get entrapped. You need the flow of oxygen. So, I think we just learn. I think we evolve. I think we go through cycles. But uh, I think it only makes us stronger and makes, uh, makes the world better. Um, we have one minute left. Okay. I could ask you more questions about your elevator testing tower, <laughs> or I can ask you um, what I think is a very important kind of macro question, which is, you know, we've spent 20 minutes now talking about the factors that help companies become more productive, technology really. What are the factors that make you less productive as a company? Like, what are some of the roadblocks and challenges to becoming more productive? Well, listen, I think we all lived through, uh, you know, we went from just-in-time manufacturing now to just-in-case mm -hmm. because we all lived through so many supply chain challenges. I, what, what I tell our team is really simple. We're going to control what we can control. We can't control geopolitics. We can't control macroeconomics. But everything else in our business we can control. So... We need to be, we need to plan ahead. We need to understand demand. We need to understand where we need to be technologically. We need to understand where we need to be on talent. You know, what does the future workforce look like for us? And we're a, we're a multi-generational kind of company. We're so proud of that. You know, we have, you know, third generation because someone's father and grandfather worked for us because they, they love this industry. And, and actually in Manhattan yesterday, mother and grandmother work for us. So it's, we're, we're getting there. But I think as leaders, we're responsible and, and have to be able to understand you'll always have challenges. You will always have headwinds coming your way. It's how you deal with that, how you communicate, and most importantly, how you get your team through change. Mm. Because change is not easy, but it's imperative, and you have to do it. If you just stay still, your business will not survive. Great. Thank you, Judy, for Thank everything. You for this is great. Appreciate it.